Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's lovely to have a decent audience because this is one of my favorite topics to speak about. Um, I love this opera uh, because it's so notorious, because it's so problematic, and also because it's so wonderful and gripping when you see it in the theater, when you listen to it on a DVD, on a CD. So if you haven't done that yet, I hope that you will do it immediately after the end of the lecture. So, uh, there's lots to talk about, so I've made a plan. <laughs> so let's see whether I'll manage to get through all of this. Uh, let's start with uh, the first point, uh, because our lecture series about opera and the state. So we will talk first about Soviet policies on music and the young Shostakovich. So here's a little bit of chronology for you. So 1917, when the two revolutions happened, the February and the October one, ones, um, uh, Shostakovich is 11, yeah, he was born in 1906, so he's a child, he's a Soviet child basically already. He'd never experienced any pre-revolutionary Russia. Uh, during the Civil War, uh, when you have art uh, being engaged in agitation and propaganda, and then um, involving even the avant-garde artists into that. Shostakovich is at the conservatoire. He's a prodigy. He goes to the conservatoire, uh, which is in Petrograd, yeah, which is the same as in Petersburg and Leningrad later, uh, just to make sure that you know, um, uh, quite early. Yeah? So uh, then you have a, a time of stability, relative stability, the new economic policy. And that's the time when Shostakovich graduates with his first symphony and creates his second symphony, which I'll mention a little bit later again. Then uh, you have the first five-year plan, uh, 1929, 28, 29. Uh, Stalin comes to power, and you have uh, uh, everything changes, cultural revolution, industrialization, collectivization, and Shostakovich is trying to uh, sort of get involved with various Soviet topics, as you will see. And then you have the next uh, stage, is uh, the Declaration of Socialist Realism. And Shostakovich's music takes a more conservative turn, becomes less avant-garde. Whether it has to do anything with that or not, we can talk about that later. So that's the young Shostakovich for you. And uh, as I've already said, uh, in the 20s, the avant-garde was very much aligned with revolutionary agitation and propaganda. Yeah, so they were not a separate stream streams, because um, the Soviet government really wanted to utilize culture, not just for educating the masses, but also for, you know, in, uh, imposing kind of the right ideas on them, changing their consciousness, building up their consciousness in the way that they wanted. Uh, so this is a very famous uh, agitational poster, yeah, which is at the same time a work of abstract avant-garde art yeah, by L. Lysitsky. Uh, and also agitprop was sometimes uh, expressed in these forms, yeah, which were quite kind of popular and uh, folk-oriented. So uh, Shostakovich gets stuck in, in that. Yeah, if you know his first symphony, it's quite classical piece. That's his graduation piece. But then the next piece, next piece he writes, which is 1927. And it's the 10th anniversary of the revolution. Our anniversaries were extremely important. And he writes this incredible symphony, which is called 2 October. Yeah, so it's a celebration of the 10th anniversary. And it brings together these things that we now think should be separate, but they weren't separate at the time, which is very avant-garde music, very dissonant, uh, very harsh, you know, incredibly kind of chaotic sounds, atonal and so on and uh, the political message. The political message was given to him. Uh, he was commissioned to write this piece. He wanted to earn the money. He thought he could go to Paris with this money. Yes, yeah, so we were not asking the question, did he really believe you know, what he was doing at that point? Um, it's not a relevant question. Yeah, he, he was working to a commission. So uh, let's hear a little bit how these two things, yeah, the avant-garde and the political message come together.
have these strange sounds. <laughs> Have this, you know, scary atonality, and next to that, yeah, very uh, confident triads and uh, and the text about Lenin and Commune and October. So that's the uh, Shostakovich in 1927. Uh, he also got involved uh, with the most progressive um, artists of the day, including several at Meyerhold. I'll mention him again. So he's he's pictured on his uh, famous sofa. He actually stayed in his house uh, for a time being. And one of the works that he wrote after the Second Symphony was his uh, avant-garde opera, The Nose. Yeah, uh, don't have time to talk about this. It's a fascinating opera. It's as avant-garde as Shostakovich would, would go. Uh, and just to show you how uh, weird it sounds in its most extreme moment, I'll play you a little bit of a scene from that. So that's a scene in a kind of newspaper department where various janitors came each with their advertisement and they want to give these advertisements. So the texts of all of these advertisements are sounding at the same time. You can read them on the, in, the, in the subtitles, but you cannot actually hear them, yeah, because they're all completely jumbled together. <laughs> You're getting the idea, yes. <laughs> as far pushing it as far as it can go, yeah, with various tricks and various theatrical inventions and musical inventions. So, uh, at the same time, he writes, uh, especially during the years of the first year plan, where there are these new slogans, you know, industrialization, collectivization, he writes these topical ballets, uh, which are very funny, but they at the same time reflect the uh, topical subject matter of that day. And for example, the bolt, yeah, it's about industrialization and sabotage, yeah, so... Uh, the bolt gets into the machine, the machine stops working and has to be fixed. Yeah, so there's always a uh, class war going on. Yeah, there are the baddies and the goodies. And this is a little clip, it's like a preview of a contemporary production of the bolt, which tells you immediately you will get the, this, this contrast of who the baddies are and who the goodies are and what kind of music they get. <laughs> He creates two styles, yeah, to represent these two um, parts of society. Yeah, the remnants of, of capitalism, all these bourgeois, you know, people who are trying to subvert the building of communism, and then yeah, yeah the people in red who have this very march-like and very energetic music. So uh, that's what he does during that period. And uh, um, as you can see that at that time, even the most avant-garde artists like Kazimir Malevich, yeah, who is of course very famous for his black square, start doing more conservative things. Yeah, there's this conservative turn in all the arts. And this is again uh, yeah, a very ideological piece. And it's, it still looks a little bit avant-garde yeah, because they are slightly weird looking, all these uh, people, yeah, they're not quite realistic. 
but nevertheless, yeah, it's not the black square. So you have this uh, you know, change of, of turn. So it's like the avant-garde having reached its, its peak, you know, is, is sort of subsiding. And the same thing uh, happens in Shostakovich's work. Um, and uh, one of the pieces which is already more conservative uh, compared with the nose and the second symphony is his first piano concerto, which is very funny. And there's this wonderful clip of him playing the cadenza from it, which I want you to see. <laughs> Incredible, isn't it? First of all, incredible how fast it is. He always plays very fast uh, his own music, sometimes to the, the detriment of it. But, <laughs> but also you can hear, you know, how naughty this is. You know, it has all kinds of popular music stuck in. There's a kind of Brahms Hungarian dance appearing and, uh, uh, you know, this kind of walking bass, um, uh, ragtime type music and so on. And at the same time, yeah, this very optimistic ending with the trumpet in C major. Uh, yeah, so that's very different from the avant-garde of the nose. You can see that already. So that's 1932, which is precisely the year when he completes the opera Lady Macbeth of Nsensk. Now, uh, I will just sort of uh, summarize of what happens in terms of uh, Soviet policies on culture. Yeah, because from the very beginning, of course, the government was aware that culture was a hugely important weapon and uh, really funded that always very well. Uh, yeah, as, as well as nowhere else, I think, and uh, cared about it. And of course, they wanted to take complete control of it, but they couldn't for a long time. And so uh, in 1918, they did a lot of things, you know, they nationalized all the institutions. And uh, instead of abolishing things like the imperial theaters, for example, yeah, they actually preserved them. They Sovietized them gradually, uh, but they didn't destroy them. The same went for the conservatories, although there was a danger yeah, for that people who wanted to have, to be, have all culture to be new just destroy these old institutions. So that didn't happen. Uh, and uh, then during the new economic policy, you had this you know, influx of uh, small capitalists and uh, government actually lost control over culture um, apart from the basic censorship that they managed to uh, preserve. And pop popular art forms flourished. And there was foxtrot and all kind of Western songs and jazz, you know, what they called jazz at the time. There was a lot of exchange with the West. Uh, and then it all changes, yeah, as I said, 1928, when Stalin comes to power, you know, that's the end of the new economic policy, the end of capitalism, everything uh, becomes incredibly, radically uh, Soviet. So uh, you have to collectivize the agriculture and build new uh, so industry, and it comes at huge cost. This is where the various uh, sort of mass, uh, you know, exiles and executions start, really, because, you know, to... Uh, put this plan into, into practice. And uh, culturally, there are certain groups which dictate a uh, very narrow idea of culture, 
and trying to really ban almost all the music that exists, you know, both jazz and Western classical and Russian classical, which is not Mussorgsky. For some reason, Mussorgsky escaped that, um, you know, because he was so about the people and so on. So, uh, so it's a very narrow and very austere form of culture that they're trying to impose, and the government seems to be going along with it, but they are not actually supporting them directly. And suddenly in 1932, you know, Stalin has had enough of this because, you know, all these culture workers were fighting with each other and he just uh, disbanded all this, these factions and basically made them all join artistic unions. Union of composers, union of artists, union of writers and so on. So they're all supposed to be on the same platform and they couldn't fight with each other because they were supposed to do the same thing. And uh, uh, this is where the notion of socialist realism starts to be developed. In 1934, it's actually promulgated at the uh, first Congress of Writers. And uh, in 1936, which is a very important year for us, yeah, the new ministry is formed. It's a cultural ministry. It's called something else. It's called a Committee for Arts Affairs. Yeah, but it's essentially a ministry. And now the control, ideological control over uh, the arts is established, yeah, kind of complete and total. And we will see how this opera played a very important role in establishing that control. So uh, this is just to show you the different sort of poles of the 20s. Yeah, so you have these Tahiti Trot and the various... Um, and I have them lyrical Western songs, fox trots, and sort of more ideological covers, although the music might have been actually similar on either side of that. But all of that, that that's the 20s, you know, that is now over. So uh, now to our second uh, point, and that's about the author of the um, literary source, Nikolai Leskov. So Nikolai Liskov is a 19th century Russian writer uh, who's probably, you know, usually considered kind of second rank yeah, after Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, but he is hugely interesting and a great stylist and very worth reading. So uh, I just put a few points on about him on the screen which seem relevant to that piece, which is actually uh, a quite an early piece. So he was a journalist originally. He was writing for a newspaper. And his father was a, an investigator for a criminal court, yeah, a detective. And he himself, when he was young, also had a desk job at the criminal court. Yeah? So this is all relevant to this piece. And he often used real life events in, in his fiction. I don't know whether this particular story is, is, um, uh, uses real life events, but nevertheless, it could be. Yeah? So because the way it's presented, it's almost like a report on something that has happened. Look, you know, how, how curious things can happen even in such, uh, you know, in the middle of nowhere, such as in the Mtsensk district. Yeah? The title is ironic. Yeah? Lady Macbeth of the Mtsensk district. Yeah? So it's in our local, you know, even in our local backwater, things like that can happen. Horrifying things. So it's presented as a kind of feature story for a newspaper. And the recounting of it is quite dispassionate. Yeah, it's just it's kind of like he's observing it from a distance. Uh, there's a sarcastic epigraph. One blushes when singing the first songs, yeah, which means that one stops blushing when singing the second and the third and the fourth. Uh, so it's about a strong woman, Katerina Ismailova, who is a merchant's wife, oppressed by her lack of power, by boredom. Uh, she has nothing to do. She has this old husband. Uh, who doesn't seem to sort of have any interactions with her and just everyone is oppressing her. She has no, nothing to do, no role in life to play. And then, you know, her passion is awakened by Sergei, the laborer on the estate, and uh, she completely changes. She becomes a slave to this passion. As you can see from that quote, yeah, Katerina Lvovna was now prepared to go into the fire, into the water, to prison, and onto the cross for Sergei. He made her love him so that there was no limit to her loyalty. And uh, because uh, in order to be with him, she commits, uh, well, three murders uh, for, at first, yeah. So she first kills her father-in-law, who is in the way, then the husband, who comes back at an inopportune moment. 
then also the, the worst thing, yeah, possibly is the, the mother of a child who happens to be an heir to the property and so she's kind of egged by Sergei to, to get rid of him as well, although she doesn't really, uh, she's not interested in being rich, but he is, yeah, so he's kind of enslaved her. And uh, eventually, you know, she goes to prison for that third murder. Uh, they both go to, to Siberia, and then uh, she also kills her rival, Sanietka, and commits suicide. Yes, yeah, so they both drown in the waters uh, of a Siberian uh, lake. So a Soviet critic describes her as a lightning born of the dark, making still more vivid the impenetrable darkness of merchant's life. Yeah, so kind of social critique in there as well. So um, uh, Shostakovich changed this significantly, and this is very important because, uh, of course, you know the message changes. Uh, so first of all, he removed the mother of a child, yeah, because uh, that was, as you will see, n not um, acceptable to him. So it's just not there. And all the other murders that she she commits, uh, they are unpremeditated. They are kind of either caused by a sense of, uh, you know, injustice and, you know, she's hurt by the fact that Sergei has been almost flogged to death and she reacts to it in this almost instinctive way in poisons her father-in-law. And also, you know, the sense of panic when the husband comes back. They are not premeditated as, as they are in Liskov. This is a, a difference. Uh, he provides her with this kind of feminist scene at the start, which I'm going to show you in a moment, which uh, sets her up as an almost heroic figure. Yeah, which are completely absent in Liskov. And also, because this was the time when he was writing this, yes, 31, 32, this is at the time of the class war. And Shostakovich, as a child of his times, kind of reflects that attitude to the enemies of socialism. Yeah, so the merchants, of course, although they're pre revolutionary, they're enemies of the people. Yeah, so they are portrayed in this kind of mocking, uh, grotesque way. And there is absolutely no sympathy for them. Yeah, they're completely dehumanized. They're like cardboard cutouts. So, uh, and Katerina, on the contrary, is a, a live character. Yeah, so she actually has emotions and because of that we are made to sympathize with her. So it's a very provocative thing what he does with this plot. He basically turns it up on, on his head. Uh, so let me um, demonstrate this through examples. So, I will show you this, what I call the feminist scene. Yeah, so he inserts this scene, which is, uh, uh, actually it is in, in, in Liskov, but, uh, you know, it, it's, this is not how it's portrayed. So there's this woman on the estate, yeah, uh, also another, I think she's a nurse or a maid, Aksinia. And there's a scene of uh, men sort of harassing her in various ways. I think it's, they're supposed to be weighing her like a pig, you know, on these huge sort of scales. Uh, it's presented in various ways, in various productions, and this is a film that we're going to see, uh, actually, of the second version of the opera, uh, but um, with the same music. And you can see this, this is very intense uh, scene where she is being subjected to this violence, you know, and uh, Katerina suddenly comes out and stops it. And not only she stops it, but she also sings this feminist arioso, you know, saying, you know, you men have to respect the women. You know, you actually uh, don't realize that women are not just your playthings. It, it's quite incredible how this appears, you know, out of nowhere. It's not in Liskov at all. So let's uh, see. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,
I said, nothing like that in Liskov. She's just a bored uh, woman, you know, who has nothing to do, no role in life. She is actually, you know, shows her strength and her character in this scene. So this is what Shostakovich grants her. And uh, as a, you know, as an, on the opposite end of the scale, you have uh, these caricatures yeah, of, uh, of other characters, such as the priest. Yeah, and again, you can compare it to some of the ballets, the topical ballets that I mentioned. I think there's a priest in the bolt as well, you know, who is, is mocked, you know. He's one of these, um, you know, cartoon cut, cardboard cutouts, you know, which they would use in various agitational spectacles, yeah. So, so this is uh, exactly the same kind of character. So what happens is that the father-in-law has just died and the priest has been called in. And he's been well paid off by Katerina. And uh, so he gets a bit married. And, and I think he, he realizes that um, he probably was killed. And these mushrooms that he's eaten are probably uh, he were poisoned. Yeah, but he's been paid off, so he doesn't mind. Good. So there's absolutely no uh, no sympathy for for the, the dead guy who is the you know lying there. So uh, let's now talk about what made this opera so notorious. The event, yeah, <laughs> the event. I'm sure you know what the event is. Yeah, that's Stalin coming to see the opera. And why I'm talking about as the event with a big E, yeah, because it's like a quilting point, yeah, if you have a quilting point on a sofa, you know, all the crumbs get in there. So it's kind of completely defined the cultural landscape around it. Everything is defined by this moment. It's a hugely important moment in Soviet cultural policy, the Shostakovich, the Lady Macbeth affair, yeah, not just for music, not just for Shostakovich, but for everyone. And let us see why. Uh, so, 26th of January 1936, he comes to see the opera. He was a, uh, an opera lover, so he often was seen at the Bolshoi Theatre, or rather not seen, kind of hiding behind the curtain. Um, the the Bolshoi Theatre, of course, was the center of uh, various official events as well. Yeah, you can see it's a kind of seat of power here, decorated with the portraits. Uh, the performance that we're talking about actually didn't take place in this building. It was the, the smaller stage of the Bolshoi Theater, a couple of streets away from here. Yeah, but it was at the Bolshoi, and it was uh, a, a, a performance of Lady Macbeth, which was already had already been performed for two years since 1934, and was incredibly successful, and was staged on several, in several theaters, both in the Soviet Union and abroad. So it wasn't a new opera, yeah, it already had this great success. And then two days later, uh, uh, there is this sharply critical article in Pravda. Yeah, so what happened on the day Shostakovich was called in, and he expected an audience with Stalin, as other composers had had in the past, but uh, Stalin and the other members of the government seemed to have left before the end. And he, of course, was hugely worried by that. And the result of that was that unsigned article uh, in Pravda. This is it. This is how big it is. Uh, so you can see that uh, it's not signed. And some people thought, oh, somebody wrote a bad review. I was too scared to sign it. Yeah, they didn't actually realize this was a new policy, a new cultural policy. There was a huge debate about who wrote it. You know, and some people said it was Stalin himself, or maybe it was the Kirchensov who was a minister, or maybe it was Zhdanov who was the cultural ideologue at the time. Actually, it turned out it was just a, a journalist at the 
in, uh, in the newspaper, Pravda, David Zaslavsky, and there is a, a fee, you know, there is a record of his fees. He was paid for it. Yeah, so we know that it was him, and he talked about it himself. But of course, you know, it was the result of Stalin being dissatisfied, so it has some ideas, presumably, that are coming from the top. So uh, I, I given on the handout, I've given you the whole text for your delectation. Uh, I'll just put some, uh, some quotes on the screen. From the fir opera's first moment, the astonished listener is assaulted by a stream of sounds that are by design in harmonious and chaotic. Snatches of melody and the bronic musical phrases are drowned, surface a final time, and finally disappear back into the general din of screeching and screaming. Such music is hard to follow and quite impossible to memorize. I don't know whether you'll agree from what I've played to you. At the time when the touchstone of our criticism is socialist realism, and this certainly includes music criticism, Shostakovich's opera puts the coarsest naturalism on stage. And then he tells you basically what I've already told you. Yeah, it's actually all true. Monotonously, all characters are presented in their most bestial colors, merchants and people alike, people and meaning the people, yeah, laborers. The predatory merchant's wife, whose path to money and power was paved with the corpses of her victims, is here presented as somehow a victim of bourgeois society. All true. Yeah, Leskov's novel of everyday life uh, is here encumbered with meanings wholly absent from the original. True? True. And how coarse, primitive, and vulgar it uh, all of this is. The music wheezes, groans, pants, and gasps for breath in order to present love scenes as naturalistically as possible. We'll get to that. It is also true. And love is smeared all over the opera in the most vulgar manner. The merchant's double bed is placed center stage, and it's on this bed that all the problems are solved. Flogging and death by poison are presented in this some same coarsely naturalistic style. All true and actually very profound thought. I will get back to that at the end. So, um, but of course, in a reading something like that in the central organ of the party, yeah, Shostakovich must have been absolutely terrified. Yeah, it was kind of an unprecedented personal attack. And he didn't know what was to follow. And uh, so what happened next is that a few days later, there was another article about he, one of his ballets, which was also sharply critical. So, you know, he went to see the minister on the same day, the culture minister, culture, and he said, what should I do? Should I write a letter of apology? Can I see Stalin? And, and the minister said to him, you know, well, you have to rethink. Well, maybe the letter is not necessary, but you have to rethink what you're doing. Why don't you go and travel along the country and collect some folk songs, you know, and do some folk song arrangement, te test your works on the workers' audience before bringing them to the stage, you know, giving them t such a kind of, um, basic advice on what a Soviet composer should be doing. So there follow lots of discussions of, of this work in various uh, forums. Uh, so one, for example, you know, one union of composers, Leningrad union of composers. Shostakovich is not actually required to be there, so he can stay silent. Uh, thankfully, on this occasion. But, uh, you know, lots of people just stop, stop speaking to him because he becomes like a, you know, leper. So, uh, but very soon everyone realizes that it's not about Shostakovich at all. Yeah, and uh, there are these words said by Sergei Eisenstein, who was, a, of course, a very famous film director. They are not going to make Shostakovich out of me in that year. And actually, that's precisely what happens. They, you know, he suffers the same fate. His film is taken off. Um, the screens, he has to, you know, do something else, completely rethink what, what he does. And the next film will be already di very different. Yeah, it will be Alexander Nevsky. So uh, he has to uh, move himself, you know, put himself on the tracks of socialist realism. And that's what everyone has to do. So this is the, the import of this campaign. It wasn't just against Shostakovich. It's about taking control and making all the artists now conform to the doctrine of socialist realism. And not even just only ideologically, but also stylistically. And because nobody can tell them how to actually do it, yeah, because you know the government couldn't tell them what notes to put on paper, but they could could uh, direct them through giving them a negative model or a positive model if there was one. Yeah, at that point there was just this negative model, Shostakovich's opera. So it was all called formalism. 
uh, you know, there is a reason why it was called formalism. It's quite difficult to explain, but I might do that in the question session. But uh, so it, it's uh, a campaign that begins in all the arts, and Shostakovich is expected to re respond to this musically. Yeah, he is not re expected to respond in a letter, but he has to change his style. He has to show that this composer number one, and he certain, certainly was a composer celebrity number one in the Soviet Union, has been reformed. Yeah? So, and uh, that's why he had to withdraw his fourth symphony, which was basically asking for trouble because it was, again, lots of chaos and muddle, as they called it, uh, in December 1936, because it was more, you know, just w w would have been much more trouble for him. And then eventually he writes his fifth symphony, which is much more classical, doesn't have these quite sort of extreme sonorities, although there's still plenty uh, to, you know, to worry about in that symphony, actually. But, um, and, you know, if they wanted, they could have rejected it as well. But there must have been a sense with the government that Shostakovich made important steps to reform and he had to be forgiven at that point. Yeah, so, and if he's forgiven, then all the critics suddenly start writing wonderful things about the Fifth Symphony. Yeah, so, so this is how the story continues. Yeah, and, but of course the opera disappears from the stages and it cannot be reformed again and Shostakovich never uh, dares to write another opera, which of course is the, the main tragic conclusion to this, yeah, because from this opera you realize what a great dramatist he was, and, you know, it, it could have been amazing if he'd, he'd written something else, but he didn't, yeah, because when there are words, it's actually much more dangerous than when there are no words, and there's just symphony, and who knows what's about, yeah. So, um, uh, we're going on to the opera itself and to its very important characteristics. Yeah, so I already mentioned this, yeah, that Katerina is given this very lyrical part, and she is the only human character, uh, apart from maybe the old prisoner at the end, who is sort of almost like an author's voice, uh, and the other characters are grotesque. So um, the um, reason for this combination is kind of two aesthetics of theater. One is Stanislavski and kind of realist theater of empathy when you're sitting and getting very involved in everything that's going on and you suffer for the, with the characters. And the other one is Sewell at Hall, who was the opposite, you know, which was a theater of grotesque uh, with lots of exaggerated movements and kind of choreographical presentation very often of events. I'll give you a little bit of um, sense of what Meyerholdian uh, theater looked like. This is actually footage from that time, yeah, so this is his set, yeah, so um, just a little bit to kind of remind, so uh, incredible exaggeration and also always the sense that you sitting in the theater are not involved, you're just be being given a show, yeah, so you're, you're not supposed to be emotionally involved in it. So these two things uh, sort of are colliding in Shostakovich's opera. And of course, if you look back to the nose, that was completely Meyerholdian. Yeah, that's when, when was he, he was living at Meyerhold's house. So that is completely grotesque. There's almost no empathy involved at all. Maybe tiny, tiny little bit, depends on the production. Yeah, but here you actually have half and half. Yeah, so the conductor, when conducting this, has to be kind of schizophrenic because you have, you know, something that is incredibly, emotional, and then, the, the, you know, it changes to a parody. So you're just switching between this. It's completely schizophrenic in that respect. So I'll, I'll give you, the, yeah, the two poles of this. So uh, Katerina sings this uh, wonderful, very melodic, kind of Russian-style song uh, when he t she talks about uh, everything in, in nature even having its purpose. Uh, you know, the, the cow gives milk, you know, the, the little sparrow, you know, carries a straw and I have no purpose in life and I'm alone and I'm bored and so on.
very lyrical with high notes, yeah, incredibly uh, affecting song. And then her father-in-law comes in with a completely different music, just as a continuation of the same scene. Have you got mushrooms for me? Yeah? And she starts speaking to him in the same way. Yeah, so it's like he draws her in the orbit of her his music, and you can see what what it means. The grotesque style. It's kind of popular style various popular genres which are distorted in some way, yeah, and presented parodically, kind of distortion of the familiar. Uh, and it can be either funny or slightly scary as well. It depends basically on where, how you want to perceive it. Uh, so this is the, the grotesque style that he developed very much in his topical ballets, yeah, for, for the portrayal of these enemies of, of socialism, yeah, and now it comes handy uh, for him in this opera. Uh, but uh, there are also, apart from Katerina having this lyricism, there are also moments, symphonic moments, where Shostakovich pr projects incredible emotional power on his own behalf as an author. And I think that's an incredibly powerful thing, because, you know, after the murder was presented in such a uh, dehumanized way, yeah, and the, the priest dancing basically, you know, near the corpse, and, and it was so, and Katerina also, uh, you know, being incredibly um, uh, so sort of false uh, in that scene. And then suddenly you have the symphonic entr'acte, which is a passacaglia, which is a piece based, yeah, on the repeating bass. And suddenly the whole horror of what happened just, you know, suddenly dawns on you, and presumably on Katerina as well. But it mainly comes from Shostakovich's own. Yes, it's, it's his own word. So just listen to uh, that uh, symphonic extra. <laughs> There's an extra um, brass band added. This is why the, the sound of this opera in various places like that is so stringent. Yeah, and it actually was reflected in that case instead of music article because uh, it, it just is incredibly noisy. It's sort of, you know, really you jump on your seat when you hear it in the theater. Yeah, and then you have this very long development of uh, the Pasacaglia theme and gradually the variations of, uh, unroll and bring you to a climax. It's a beautiful piece of music. And another moment like that happens at the end when uh, Catherine is already yeah, in the camp and she's lost everyone, everything and lost Sergei and, uh, and she's being mocked by the prisoners yeah, because no matter how um, similar the situation is in this place, in this hell, yeah, there's always a chance to put down somebody even lower. Yeah, this is unfortunately our human nature. And this is what happens, they mock her and that's absolutely the end of her. You know, she cannot go any further, she's completely cornered. And you have this incredible symphonic statement of utter limit of what a person can take. How to be loud this.
I mean, when you hear it in, in the house with this absolutely incredible sound, it's like a wave covers you, you know. This is, this is what makes you sympathize with Katerina because you are kind of also covered by this wave of sound. Uh, it's, it's totally physical, you know, you can't resist it. Uh, Shostakovich is an amazing uh, dramatic composer. He can just grip you and, you know, manipulate you into being completely powerless to resist this music. So, um, so this is what happens, yeah. Uh, and um, where are we? Okay. Um, what, another point that I wanted to make, that because of all this, because of this Stanislavskian kind of empathy, yeah, this opera, and you must realize this, is, is much more conservative already yeah, than the nose. Yeah, so it actually moves to a more conservative aesthetic and more traditional operatic aesthetic. Um, and it's just, it kind of doesn't go far enough, in a sense, for, for the Soviet authorities. Yeah, they would have wanted all the grotesque taken out altogether, which is indeed will happen. Yeah, but at that point, it's, he's already halfway. So it's not like he's necessarily pushed by the party and the government to change from avant-garde to 19th century expressiveness, yeah, expression. But he is already on that path, you know, for, for various reasons, maybe just because, you know, there was no, no further way to go with avant-garde and, and lots of people in the whole world were becoming more conservative. And for that reason, yeah, it uh, actually aligns itself with various Russian operas and I would like to make this connection with Boris Godunov because someone, some, some of you might have heard my lecture on Boris Godunov last time, uh, because there's actually even a quote <laughs> from Boris Godunov. And this happens when, yeah, her father-in-law is dead and, and she, she laments, uh, but it's a pretend lament. Yeah, so it's a fake lament. She just starts howling. Um, but uh, there is also a pretend lament in Boris Godunov, yeah, when they're crying for him to, to come to the throne without actually feeling any of that, but just because they're told to. Yeah, so Shostakovich takes the same tune and gives it to Katerina. hear the grotesque accompaniment, yeah, which makes it a distortion, a parody. Uh, but there's also a very serious reference to Boris Godunov at the very end of the opera, because it ends very much like Boris Godunov, with this uh, lament of the prisoners and the old prisoner, and kind of absolutely black, black kind of, you know, um, ending uh, without any hope. Um, this is the text uh, of that uh, uh, chorus. Uh, I'm not going to play it with the text because after they sung the text there is also a, a textless bit. I'll just play you a little bit of that. very similar to the uh, Holy Fool's Lament in Boris Godunov, only here is that the people are kind of lamenting their fate themselves. And the only difference that is in Boris Godunov, it all goes away, and here at the end you suddenly have this crashing chord at the end, you know, the, the rage of the composer. Yeah, so it's, it's a bit different. So anyway, uh, let's go to uh, finally the last argument. And uh, <clears throat> so this is about the main seen, yeah, that uh, offended so many um, people. Yeah, so uh, the sexual scene between Katerina and Sergei, which is often presented as a rape, or sometimes it's presented in a comedy way, as a kind of seduction. Uh, and of course, you know, these days it, it becomes very, um, sometimes uh, incredibly difficult to uh, stage it or to talk about it, because you know, young students can tell me this is actually glorification of rape. We don't want to see this. You know, this is offensive to us. Um, and indeed, you know, it's a very kind of problematic scene. So, uh, of course, in Stalin's time, there wouldn't have been any naked people 
prancing about on stage. Yeah, you have to realize that. Yeah, so there was a bed, yeah, but there was probably nothing going on there. But nothing needed to go on on stage because it's all in the music. Yeah, so I'm going to play you the music without any production so that you can appreciate this. Sorry, ignore that. Graphic, yeah. Uh, so, as an, one American critic said, pornophony. Yeah. So you don't actually have to have the picture. Everything is there. But the point is how you stage it. You know, you can stage it in a comedy way, like Richard Jones did at the Royal Opera House, which which is hilarious. You know, at the, the, the climax, the, the door of the wardrobe sort of opens. <laughs> you can't see anything, but it's just so hilarious. Everyone sort of laughs. But the you know, is it, is it actually ethical for us to present it in a comedy way? And, and is it actually rape? You know, should we call it rape? You know, she seems to be fancying him. You know, how, how should we treat this scene? So it becomes very problematic today, yeah, when we talk about Me Too and things like that. So my answer, you know, I was thinking of that a lot, a long time, of how to give it to students, how to sort of get to the, the point um, of what Shasta Coach is trying to do. And I think... Basically, Shostakovich uh, can be exonerated because the, the way he presents this music, it connects to other scenes of violence and oppression in the opera. I'm going to demonstrate it to you musically. Yeah? So, uh, the scene of flogging. Mm-hmm. You have the music going up like that. Yeah? The scene of Axinia, which you've seen. So almost the same, yeah? I actually thought it was the same example when I put them together. That's how, I, how well I edited it, yeah? I actually thought I made a mistake. They are in, identical. And there's a fourth one which you can add to it, which is precisely the moment when Katerina is mocked at the end. Yeah, so it's actually also this kind of psychological warfare, you know, oppression, violence, 
which is, doesn't have to be physical. So this is what this opera is about, and this is what Shostakovich comes out as against. The suppression of one, per, by, one person by another person, and the violence. And uh, so he presents this scene as rape. I, I have absolutely no uh, reason to think otherwise musically. You know? Even though there is a comedy moment in there, but it's a very black comedic moment. So, uh, we have to, to end now, but I wanted to show you, first of all, that in the 60s, uh, Shostakovich did a second version of it. Yeah, eventually, he ha had wanted to revive it, and this is what he did, yeah, replaced various pages of the score. And uh, uh, if I have a couple of moments, I will show you how this sex scene is done now in the new version, which is in the film. <laughs> father-in-law yeah so uh it, musically it's shortened and it's cut and it actually has a very different effect and uh so you know the the issue is this what Shostakovich wanted to be performed he wanted to the opera to be performed the sec to be the second version Katerina Ismailova and his widow Irina Anton is still insisting that this is what we should hear not Lady Macbeth that is staged everywhere now. Because the, uh, the interesting thing is also when this was revived and Rostropovich uh, recorded it with Vishnevsky in 1979, it was on the wave of anti-Soviet attitudes. So they went for the, the most titillating, the most yeah, sexual version possible, which was the very first version of the libretto, which actually had never been even staged. It was cut yeah, and changed before the premiere. So it's actually our choice if we go for this extreme extremely yeah, uh, offensive version. It is our choice. We don't have to do it. We can actually modify the version in, and possibly you know, uh, look at Katerina Ismailova as something that Shostakovich wanted uh, to be produced instead of Lady Macbeth. So um, this is the story of this fascinating work, and I hope that you will continue uh, learning about it and listening to it and I hope that it enriches your life uh, as much as it has enriched mine. Thank you very much.